Okay, so Pinky, you are officially being recorded right now. Okay. Um, and so if you could just maybe introduce yourself and talk about why you were even deciding on DBS in the first place. What was like life oh like gosh. before DBS? Pinky Carl. Life before DBS was really just not even life. It was a matter of trying to manage an unmanageable situation with a pill. And the pills are a double-edged sword, I'm here to tell you. One of those necessary evils that it like helps a little bit, but for this much help, there's this much crap that you get. And if you're a big Frady cat like I was, and you don't want the thought of somebody drilling into your brain, and you want to put it off as long as possible, I get it. Call me. <laughs> I will help you change your mind and get over it. Because once I changed my mind and got over it, this is every day for me. I couldn't go anywhere without my walker. I couldn't think about being anywhere without a bag full of pills. I was dependent on other people to help me and do things that I could no longer do, that I should be able to do. I'm only 56. I mean, which I'm not no spring chicken. Mm. But I'm not like a hugely old hen that's ready to be roasted. <laughs> so, <laughs> so once I finally got over myself and decided to have the DBS and had my sister drag me there and tell me failure is not an option. Failure is not an option. You only fail yourself if you don't try it. And I'm, I can honestly say the best thing I've ever done for myself. Best thing I've ever done for myself. So when you wake up with four million staples in the top of your head, you also get prevented, presented with this lovely, what I call my garage door kicker. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the difference between life with Parkinson's and life with Parkinson's. So I'm going to turn it off if I remember how, because I don't do this very often. Just make sure. Okay, everything's off. And then let's gives you a little rush and that not in a good way. Not like when you were 16 and try and plop for the first time. <laughs> it's a rush like, like you want to hurl kind of rush. But then, oh, now even my foot, see, it's, it's about, my take is, it takes about four seconds to get from up here to wow down here. And this was literally Every day. How I was every day. And when you really humanly do not think you can stand it anymore, you go in and you let them drill a hole in your head and they make it better. And so then I'm going to remember how to turn this back on. And the magic of the clicker. Hold well, immediate for the foot and about four seconds for the hand. I get my little 16-year-old I'm smoking pot for the first time rush, and I feel like a regular human being. So if anybody out there who sees this in the very near or very long future, I will not be a hand ready for the roasting pot anytime soon. I encourage you to do it for yourself, for your loved ones, for the hell that whatever reason gets you there. And if you can't, reach out to me. I will go to appointments with you. I will sit with you. I will talk to you, whatever you need, but do it for you. Was there a acclimation period? Was it magically perfect from the beginning or did it take a couple months to get the settings right? It has taken a couple months to get the settings right. And the thing that I have found out with my magical clicker and my doctor team is that 
nothing is perfect and it's never perfect, but perfect for you is what you will find and that's what you've got to find. You've got to find your niche because each time I go to my neurologist and he adjusts it, I've got four electrodes on each side of my brain. One is always better than the other. I always settle on a particular setting and then when I have a follow-up with my neurologist, he adjusts it and gives me different functions, which might be fine for a day or two, but then I start having a little bit of residual effects. Like my thing is I feel like I'm walking and like I'm chasing my head all the time, like I'm drunk or something and I'm like, over. but I, I go back to my comfort setting, which just happens to be B, and then I'm good, then I can do it. And I do a combination of this, and I do still take some carbidopa levodopa, but not enough where I feel like hurling or where I've got the dyskinesia where I just can't absolutely sit. And that's the best thing. Because you take enough carbidopa levodopa to stop all this, then you've got all this. And, you, and if any of you feel like I do, you fucking hate it. But. How many pills a day were you taking before surgery and how many are you taking now? I was taking 16 to 20 a day, every day before surgery. Now I take four and as of my appointment the other day, Dr. Roberts recommended I take six because I take two, two and two, just to kind of even out some of my mm -hmm. unsteadiness, mm -hmm. which is great. Awesome. Any downsides, like just realistic, honest assessment of helping people expect reality about the only downside that i can think of is that i should have done it a lot sooner a lot sooner and i just couldn't get over the whole brain thing and waking up in the middle of surgery thing i just i couldn't wrap my head around it but once i did yeah no the only downside was i should have done it sooner all right, I'm gonna give your number to people who are nervous. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. More than welcome.